Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Let me warmly welcome you on behalf of Academia 2063 and IFPRI to our seminar today on a topic of great importance for the transformation of rural economies in Africa. We will be hearing today the key messages and findings of the 2022 Annual Trends and Outlook Report on agri-food processing strategies for successful food systems transformation in Africa. This, this report is prepared by RESACS, the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System, with, which is supported by both Academia 2063 and IFPRI. We have a great panel of experts with us. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And we are very keen to hear from our audience. Um, please think about your questions as you listen to the speakers and put them in your various chat functions, and we will get to them during the Q&A sessions. You can submit these questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. And to kick us off, uh, we have some welcome remarks from uh, Johan Swinnen, who is, of course, uh, the Director General of IFPRI, as well as the Managing Director of the Systems Transformation Science Group in the CGIR. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to our seminar here today, uh, where we will discuss the latest RESAC uh, Annual Trends and Outlook report. Uh, the report is on agri-food processing strategies for successful food system transformation in Africa. This is a very important topic. It's also a very timely topic. We know that food systems need to be transformed urgently and profoundly in the world and also in Africa. This is needed for various goals, also to become more resilient for our food system going forward. We also know that this transformation is complex and that it involves a coordination among many stakeholders, many partners in the food system. The food processing sector really is in the midst of this. We often talk about consumers and producers in our policy discussions, our economic models, but the food processing sector is really both. It is a consumer for farmers and it is a producer for households who are consuming the ultimate consumers of the food. So it's in the core of the food value chain. In a recent paper that uh, a number of colleagues and myself, uh, including Tom Reardon, who's on the panel here with us today, have written, we write about the revolution of agri-food value chains. And this revolution has taken place to some extent, is taking place and will continue to take place. Some of it is very visible. Some of it is a silent revolution, a silent a term that has been coined by uh, Tom and Bart Minton of IFPRI. These are really important components of our transformation. Uh, for example, in rich countries, we know that less than 10% of consumer spending on food goes to the farms. In developing countries, this is higher, but recent studies point out that even in middle and low income countries, on average, that this share is about 30%. So that means that the majority of consumer spending is not going to go to agriculture, but going to other components of the food chain, and importantly, to the food processing sector. The food processing sector is also very important in terms of employment, creator of new jobs in rural areas, in urban areas, in linking both of them. And this uh, employment typically grows with economic development, so it is a growth area for uh, future employment for the young in uh, developing countries in Africa. However, for this transformation to be successful, we know that a conducive, a good policy and institutional environment is required. This has to be there for, uh, for investments to take place. It also has to be there for these investments and this food processing development to stimulate efficient growth, but also inclusive growth. The report that we discussed today documents many of these uh, trends in Africa. Um, most of these trends are consistent with global developments in the past. It also examines key policies that are needed for a successful food systems transformation. It shows, for example, that there's been significant growth in demand in Africa for perishable, high-value processed foods, and this is affecting the food value change, obviously. There's also very strong growth in off-farm employment within the agri-food system and that these new jobs, including in the, in the processing sector, will uh, account for, they estimate, for 20% of new jobs in the next five years in countries such as Tanzania, Nigeria and other African countries. We are in the midst of a number of crises and the report 
uh, identifies how a successful transformation, successful strategies uh, will look like dealing with both the general uh, transformation problems and the specific conditions which are the specific challenges imposed by the crisis we face. So I'm going to end here and let me end by thanking all the authors of the chapters, or the editors, all the panel members today, and of course all of you for being with us uh, in the seminar today, and I really look forward to the discussion here. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, uh, it is now my pleasure to turn to Godfrey Bahigua from the African Union uh, in charge there of agriculture. Godfrey, we know it's a busy time. Um, and sorry, I'm having some issues here. Uh, uh, Godfrey Bahigua from the African Union, thank you for joining us. We know it's a busy time. And please put this report into the context of the thinking within the AU on this very important topic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Uh, let me start by thanking IFPRI and Academia 2063 for inviting the African Union Commission to be part of this uh, important webinar. And um, the AUC uh, was part of the uh, 2022 RISAC's annual conference that was held last year in Harare, uh, Zimbabwe, and we were part of the discussions when the initial um, when the ATOR was, uh, was presented. So from the AU perspective, uh, we believe that agro-processing is already playing and will continue to play a great role in the transformation of food systems on the continent, and as you just heard from, from Johan. Our continental flagship program, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, popularly known as CADAP, um, and the Africa Common Position that we developed for the uh, UN Food Systems Summit in September, both emphasize the need to increase investments in agro-processing uh, on the continent for three key reasons. One is reduce post-harvest food losses, uh, which are um, in, uh, in, in, in a lot of our value chains, some estimates from range from 20 to 30% uh, loss. Second is facilitate trade by reducing um, bulk transportation of, of uh, raw food, foods and therefore reducing um, uh, transportation costs across borders and also increasing shelf life for the, uh, for the foods. And three is to meet the needs of the rapidly growing um, urban population in Africa. And for this reason, the continent has taken um, several steps that are complementary in nature to supporting agro-processing. We have uh, developed a continental post-harvest loss strategy and that was adopted by our member states in 2019. We have um, a continental SPS sanitary strategy uh, that was developed also endorsed by member states in 2019. And last year, 2022, we also developed um, and had endorsed the food strategy for food, food safety strategy for Africa. So the combination of these continental strategies that have been uh, um, uh, developed and endorsed by our member states create an opportunity for uh, investments or guiding policy frameworks that support agro-processing on the continent. Also, we have developed um, a program that is called the Common Africa Agroparks Program. And I believe you will hear a little bit more um, about this from, from my colleague, Janet. Um, and this program is under development. And the idea basically is to support the development of agroparks around key transboundary value chains across, across the continent. And there are eight of those value chains. I will not get into the detail, but just know that we have a program that we have developed. It is still be being um, uh, further uh, uh, worked on, led by my colleague Janet, and she will say more, to support agro-processing on the continent in the interest of the three factors I laid earlier, but also taking advantage of the opportunities that have been created by the Africa continental free trade area. And finally, um, 
we were requested by our member states to develop studies that will further inform this common Africa agro-pass program. So we'd like to invite IFPRI and Academia 2063 to join us as we prepare the documents that will go to the ministers uh, later this year when they meet uh, either in October or November. They requested us to produce um, papers around this program. And since a lot of work has been done um, already in the 2022 annual trend and law to report, we invite you to join hands with us as we prepare those documents for our member states. I think with that, Charlotte, I will leave it there. And I thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to be part of this important webinar. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Godfrey. And indeed, Janet Edeme will join us. She's going to be the first person on our panel to follow the, the overview of the report. And we look forward to hearing more about the uh, CAP program, as well as the meetings that you just mentioned and the preparation for those as well. So now it's my pleasure to turn over to Usman Badian, who serves uh, as the executive chairperson of Academia 2063. Um, Usman, uh, it's always great to partner with Academia. Uh, welcome, and please also help set the scene for this report from, from your perspective. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to join you and uh, our friends and colleagues from IFPRI on this seminar, and thank you for hosting it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, friends, thank you and welcome for those who are joining us. Uh, we find ourselves at a critical uh, junction in terms of uh, food system transformation in Africa. Uh, after two decades of sustained economic growth across the continent, continued population growth, rising middle class, and a rapid uh, urbanization, the fastest pace in the world. Uh, the uh, patterns of demand and uh, food that are being supplied have changed uh, and are continuing to change uh, very rapidly. From um, home-based, uh, simple, unalterated foods, uh, demand is moving towards uh, more processed foods, ready to cook or even uh, ready to eat. And that has uh, changed uh, the food value chains uh, that has led to an emerging and a stronger processing sector, which today is actually one of the most important elements that are shaping the dynamics of agricultural commercialization, of structural change and rural sector development. And that is why this ATOR and the topic is so important. It used to be to modernize agriculture, you needed to get um, a traditional uh, uh, substance-oriented agriculture towards a more commercialized and market-oriented agriculture. That is still the case, but the constraints are different and the conditions are different. Let me look quickly at the traditional supply chain when we're trying to uh, uh, remove the constraint barriers, I'm sorry, the demand constraints and allow farmers to tap into demand to create assets to generate wealth. In the traditional supply chains, the biggest problems that we faced was to expand the catchment area, to overcome the physical barrier, to allow goods to go from production areas towards urban centers. Products were that altered at the minimum. So the bandage there was the catchment area and the barrier we were facing was the physical distance. In that context, we're trying to get goods to go from production area to village district to rural town to secondary town to urban centers to get to demand. Those critical supply chain functions then were collection, assembly, cleaning, sorting, storage, transports, and so on and so forth. We're focusing on farmers' cooperatives, market infrastructure, transport, all those different things to move goods across space and over time and therefore expand the demand potential. That's no longer the case in this new and transformed value chain. The distance separating farmers and the markets is no longer a physical distance. It's a distance of product sophistication. It's a difference of the degree of sophistication and product innovation. Currently, 72% of food that is traded among African countries um, uh, is processed. Within West Africa alone, 
77% of what is traded is processed. So this is where the demand is for tomorrow. And there the currency is no longer physical, as I said, but it is one of degree of product sophistication, product innovations. So in that sense, the critical supply chain functions are no longer the traditional ones. Yes, they are still there, but in addition to those, we're talking about functions like cleaning, grading, processing, first, second, and search stage, packaging, branding, distribution, and safety. But also we're talking about from level capacities, enterprise creation, technology acquisition, access to capital, skills development, both technical and managerial. Those allow you to expand um, uh, uh, the constraints that are faced in terms of meeting the demand of the emerging class of consumers in urban centers, and therefore expand the demand for raw materials. You also need to deal with firm growth and performance, transport technology, conservation technology, energy supply, digital infrastructure, non fuel standards, intellectual property and competition policies, what they do to increase the competitiveness of the emerging uh, processing sector and therefore position them to capture a growing share of the growing market and therefore expand demand for uh, smallholders. Unless you can get this emerging processing sector to perform well, and to compete, you are not going to get rid of the increased supply of foods and agricultural products in the rural areas. They will rot. It's no longer the highways, it's no longer the source infrastructure, it's no longer the trading sector, it is the processing sector, it's the competition, it's performance. Therefore, the importance of this ATOR and what you're going to be hearing here today. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Excellent, Usman. I, I think you painted such a great picture of the tremendous importance of this sector. Uh, so we will now uh, actually hear some of the key findings and recommendations of the report. And it's my pleasure uh, to turn over to Geto Tadese, who's the Director of Operational Support at Academia 2063, to provide us uh, with, with those key findings. And um, to the audience, we will be coming to the Q&A portion soon after the panel. And we, again, we invite you to submit your questions to ifree.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfri on Twitter. Over to you, Geta. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, may I get my presentation? Okay, thank you. So uh, I just uh, present the overview of the 2022 uh, ATOR report, which is on uh, agri-food processing uh, strategies for successful food system transformation uh, in Africa. Next, uh, in my overview, next, uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, the content of the, the report uh, back the content of the report and also the key findings, uh, the key findings that we organize into three sections or parts, the general findings, value chain specific findings and policy investment findings. Next, please. So I think the motivation of this author, I think Usman has very much uh, explained it, why we are very much interested on agri-food processing sector. And it's roots back with the CADAP, as, as Godfrey said, and with the Malabo Declaration, it has been uh, recognized as for triggering accelerated growth and transformation and for prosperity and improved livelihood, agro-processing has been identified as key value chain uh, sectors where we, we should invest a little bit policies and investments. And achieving such ambitious goals required that each component of the system performs efficiently. And then a high performing, resilient, competitive processing sector is critical to overall performance of the food system. So in general, this means the CADAP has recognized that in order to achieve its higher goal of prosperity and improve livelihoods, uh, the, the agri food processing sector is considered as key sector for, for achieving these goals. Next, uh, that is just a background why we are very much interested on this. So then the, this report has uh, focused, on, as I said before, in three major parts. The first one, it looks at patterns, structures, and performance of the sector, the agro, the agri-food processing sector. And the second part, it, it looks into 
the, the dynamics of selected value chains. Selected value chains in uh, uh, horticulture, uh, livestock, and to some extent on stubbers. And also we looked at the policy and investment option in different areas. So these are the three uh, major components of the, 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 the ATOR, but it's divided into 10 chapters. Next, please. So the first finding, the general finding that I, I think uh, as, as uh, John Sweenan said, that the sector represents a very substantial share of total manufacturing employment and value added. So we looked at different data, both from the trade perspective and from employment perspective, labor productivity perspective. So that, that showed that the agro uh, processing sector contributes the higher share of the total manufacturing employment uh, in African uh, economies. And small and medium enterprises and informal firms constitute the largest share of the agro food processing firms. So unlike, unlike the other sectors, and uh, most of the firms are informal and small and medium enterprises. And the processed and agricultural products account for a large and increasing share of intra-African agricultural trade. So the intra-African agricultural trade is highly dominated by processed agricultural products compared to other products. So this, this showed that the potential for uh, intra-regional uh, trade of improving this, this, this sector. And finally, we also, re, uh, I mean, the report has also uh, recognized that or identified that agri food processing plays a role of revitalizing smallholder commercialization. So I think we have been struggling to, to, to commercialize smallholders through different institutional innovations. But one way for, for this day is to, to uh, I mean, improve or bring agro processing sectors that can help to link uh, farmers with markets and all these things. Next, these are the major findings in general. And with value chain specific uh, studies or chapters, uh, we looked at different case studies, for example, tomato products in Ghana and in Nigeria, pineapple products in West Africa, traditional African vegetables in Kenya and Tanzania, beef exports from Botswana and Namibia, beef trade in West Africa, uh, meat production uh, in East Africa, and poultry uh, in Mozambique and Ghana. So all these case studies have been uh, closely looked at and their dynamics and their challenges, their opportunities and all those things. So the key findings, just yes, we summarize that some of the challenges they depend on the value chain. For example, for fruits and vegetables, the key challenges were low and unpredictable productivity. So it's very variable productivity over years, seasonal and high, highly perishable as we expect. That's this, this, uh, these are the key problems and poor transport infrastructure and efficient uh, cold chain facilities. These are the key challenges in fruits and vegetables for meat, beef and poultry, uh, lack of quality control, reliable local animal feed safe sector and poor, poor veterinary services. These are some of the key sectors in general as a common uh, lack of well-functioning linkage between producers and process have been identified as key challenges uh, within these specific sectors. And this will have different implications on um, transaction costs, uh, on, on access to food, safe food, and access to, uh, I mean, <laughs> markets and all these things. And then the, the, the report has proposed some policy and uh, program interventions. Next. And then uh, once we identify, I mean, uh, reviewed some of the specific value chains, then we, we, the, the report looks into some policy, specific policy issues. The first one is related to skills and knowledge and how the skills and knowledge in the sector, the agri-processing sector, limited opportunities to acquire skills and knowledge. That's one of the challenges that have been identified and discussed in the, in the chapters. And public education and training system, face funding and human resource limitation as expected, and it's more so for this sector. And public education often doesn't cover areas of new and emerging technical skills, because as we know, the sector is growing and it requires a very specific knowledge and technical knowledge, which are not yet incorporated into the different training sessions and programs that have been organized in the continent. And also there is limited interaction between training institutions and industry results. Next. Uh, 
uh, we also looked at some of access to finance. I mean, as we you, you might expect, a large percentage of agro-processing firms in have identified as, as very key factors for the success of agri-processing sectors uh, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the continent. Next, please. And the other policy issue that we looked at is the innovation. And we uh, unfortunately, we looked at uh, over times and across sectors and all these things. And then uh, it looks like that the innovation is not yet enough uh, because of several reasons that have been discussed uh, in the, the report. Uh, next, please. And then we uh, the, the chapters, we have two chapters, one on industrial clustering, the other one on agri parks, and they uh, looked at how this industrial clustering and agri parks contributes for the growth and performance of the sector. And uh, the, the, the finding showed that there is significant strategic importance of industrial cluster for transforming African agriculture into high value uh, industry. However, two challenges remain very important. First, the rate of uh, clustering is very low. And the second is government sponsored agro industrial parks are not yet sufficiently successful yet. There are a lot of agro industries, but they are not yet successful enough to, to, to support the sector. Next, please. Finally, I mean, the, 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 the sector, uh, we, the, I mean, the report has made some conclusion uh, in chapter 10, and then it, it, it outlines the importance of the sector and how that contributes to the, di the, the different aspects of uh, the economy, especially on uh, providing sustainable healthy diets for all. And, but it also identifies some of the challenges related to knowledge, infrastructure, innovation, and all these things. And then by doing that, uh, we uh, I mean, outline three important recommendations. The first one is expand successful industries and best practices. So from the case studies, we understand that there are a lot of uh, successful cases that can be expanded uh, across the continent. The second is strengthen the transformation of agriculture processing firms. Before the firms are small, the firms are informal, they don't have access for uh, finance and everything. So that's the area where uh, the sector can be improved. And finally, there are some failed uh, policies in the sector that can be uh, improved. So these are some of the key findings. I, I hope uh, you can go through the report. It's available online. And with this next, and thank you for, for the time. Back over to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Getag. Very nice overview of this uh, really comprehensive report. Um, Godfrey already uh, uh, indicated that we have another speaker joining us from the uh, from the African Union Commission. Janet Ademe is with us. She is the head of the Rural Development Division at the Department of Agriculture. And Janet, thanks for being with us. Um, you're going to speak to us about the um, African Union's Common Africa Agro Parks Program, which seeks to increase intra-African agricultural trade and in that way contribute to meeting CADAP uh, Malibu goals through the creation of regional agro-industrial hubs. Would you describe the program for us and, and maybe look at some of the key areas uh, that it focuses on? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all our participants and also my fellow speakers. And I am pleased to be a part of this um, IFPRI policy seminar on the 2022 annual trends and outlook reports, and also to provide some insights and perspectives on the African Union's Common African Agroparks Program, uh, which is now popularly, uh, popularly known as the CAPS. And this program is beginning to evolve within the current context on food systems transformation in Africa. And as some of us may be aware, the African Union Commission has been working with uh, various partners to focus more attention on strategies, on programs and initiatives for improving food security, both at the continental, the regional and the national level for our continent to recover, not only from the shocks of COVID-19 and also the Russian uh, Ukraine crisis, but also to get prepared for other global future food crises. And today the drive of the commission is focused on how we can take advantage of the African continental free trade area to engage in bold concerted efforts that will allow Africa to harness its huge potential in such a way that it responds to the continent's demand for interventions that are aiming specifically at number one, 
trying to increase the supply of domestically produced agricultural goods, reversing the projections of our huge import bill, which is currently about 50 billion US dollars, and also adding value in the processing of agricultural commodities towards boosting intra-African trade and investments. The Common African Agro Pacts um, is envisioned to be a very great starting point to reach the continent's ambition of also tripling our intra-African trade for agricultural commodities and services as adopted by our African Union heads of states in the Malabo Declaration. The Commission believes that the partnerships already established for implementing the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program agenda, which my director Godfrey had already alluded to, uh, will be further consolidated to support this very concrete program that will help our continent to substantially move toward the realization of the agriculture related aspirations of the African Union Agenda 2063. And I'm glad that IFPRI and Academia 2063 are already strategic partners supporting this continental agenda. Now, the Common African Agro Parks Program, we are envisioning it as five large common agro industrial zones with transboundary mega agro industries and food supply corridors that will be established in suitable agroecological zones in areas in each of the five African Union recognized regions. Each region within its agro industrial zone will be facilitated will be facilitated in focusing on the production and processing of agricultural commodities of its comparative advantage to produce sufficient quantity of the commodity that can gradually offset the huge import bill of such commodities. The Common African Agro Pacts is jointly coordinated presently by the Commission, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, Auda NEPAD, Afrexim Bank, and FARA as the Secretariat of the program. The Commission has already initiated engagement with some strategic partners, such as UNIDO, and we're happy as well to have IFPRI on board, and the UN Economic Commission for Africa and FAO that are supporting the Commission in undertaking feasibility studies for some identified CAPS, what we are calling the pilot projects to be implemented over the coming years. And we're looking at these projects to be able to generate some experiences and lessons that will guide the establishment of the larger transboundary regional comprehensive Africa, comprehensive African agro parks programs. The CAPS development process is very intensive in terms of knowledge generation on agri foods processing experiences on the continent. And I wish to commend this very interesting work of IFPRI and Academia. 2063 for focusing the 2022 annual trends and outlook reports on the agri-food processing strategies for successful food systems trans transformation in Africa. And the commission is convinced that the outcomes of this 2022 report will complement many other continental reports and guidelines to strengthen our reflection on how to better refocus our already existing strategies and programs, including the very important political will for the successful implementation of the CAPS. On the 17th of February, in the margins of the upcoming AU summit, uh, the Commission through our department will be organizing a donors and investors roundtable for the implementation of the CAP. And in addition, a tripartite memorandum of understanding between the Commission, Afrexim Bank, and FARA towards the implementation of the CAP would also be signed during the roundtable conference. And in conclusion, I would like to use this opportunity to call on other partners who are yet to engage with the Commission to join us in implementing the CAP, which is gradually becoming a priority program of the Commission, contributing to the implementation of the AFCFTA in line with the AU theme for this year, which is on accelerating the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Thank you very much, and back to you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Janet, for really mapping out this very, very ambitious and, and important uh, CAPS program. And of course, the linkage with the negotiations underway on an African uh, continental free trade area are go hand in hand with this topic. And, and I think you, you pointing out that increasing uh, trade also of, uh, of processed foods within Africa can certainly help to reduce that very hefty import bill. So, so thanks, really a great overview of the program. We're, we're sticking with the topic of, um, of uh, agro-industrial hubs and uh, turning now to UNIDO, which uh, Janet has also mentioned is involved in, in the CAPS program. 
Uh, delighted to have Dejen Tazera with us. He is the director of the Department of Agribusiness Development at UNIDO. And um, Dejen, UNIDO has a strong commitment uh, to this topic and strengthening agri-food processing in, in Africa, uh, in, in particular on agro-parks. Now, I, I would point out that the ATOR, the report, does indicate that agro-parks have an important role to play, but they also, the authors also indicate that there have been some challenges and failures in the past um, to try to uh, organize these, these agro parks, perhaps due to insufficient targeting or not enough provision of supporting services, or sometimes maybe a lack of alignment with broader development strategies. Could you speak to us about what has worked well um, with regard to the projects you have supported and, and perhaps some of the learnings um, from projects that perhaps did not work so well? Thanks so much for joining us, Dijen. You may be on mute, Dijen. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, and good morning and good afternoon. Uh, colleagues, and I think let me start by by let's say uh, agreeing with a presentation of uh, Getao, which is, there's the importance of agri processing sector and the, the the transformation of the agricultural system in Africa. And I can even add to that that the sector could open market, uh, which is worth of about hundred billion dollars, and can be the engine of Africa's structural transformation. But the full potential of this agro process sector has not been realized for very um, um, issues, uh, critical challenges faced by, by the sector, which, which includes, let's say, in a big infrastructure deficit, unavailability or an expensive finance, a skills and a knowledge deficit, weak linkages to the agriculture sector, and more importantly, a lack of coordination of stakeholders, especially different ministries involved in, in agro industry or agribusiness development, which include Minister of Agriculture, Industry, Trade, Finance, and Minister of Infrastructure for the, the to, to, to provide at least a basic utilities like, like power, water, and so on. As all these institutions and uh, ministries play a critical role in unlocking all these critical constraints, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. We have been working together with FAO and other partners on the design of agro-industrial parks or agro-food parks to unlock also these critical challenges. It is believed that if, of course, if properly designed and implemented, the agro-parks can be a very effective tool for long-term process of structural transformation and rural development by creating a platform for interaction of all stakeholders involved in agriculture and agribusiness development. UNIDO, and here in UNIDO, we have established a dedicated division uh, since the last uh, six months for the development of agro-industrial parks and rural development, and mostly working with development financial institutions for large scale investment in these areas. And we work at macro level, at the policy and strategy development. We work at meso level, building capacities of uh, national and regional institutions. And at the macro level, we also provide support to enterprises level, mainly in the management and entrepreneurship uh, uh, space. At the moment, uh, we are involved in about 12 agro food parks, which are, of course, at different stage of development from pre feasibility into full operation. And then, if we go into, into the details of which parks have worked or which parks have not worked, it will be extremely difficult to, to, to do this assessment at the moment because um, the, the development of the park, especially the infrastructure and the linkages, takes minimum seven to 10 years, so it will be too early to make any conclusion. The main objective of the park is, is, of course, to create an investment opportunity for the private sector. That's the, the, the overall purpose of our parks. And this is facilitated through reducing the initial investment cost, which is sometimes prohibitive in most of the African context. And then we did a bit of an assessment and we saw that a part an industry investing in agro-industrial parks 
um, costs him only 10% of the total cost if the park with if the industry was established outside the park. Also, the shared services like cold storage um, and dry storage facilities also drastically reduce the operation cost of the industry, so it will attract the, the investment or domestic or foreign direct investment. The main objectives, again, to go into military is to alleviate the, the infrastructure problem and then uh, create a linkages with, with, the, with the farmers and with the farmers' cooperatives, and then more importantly, to create uh, a platform for all value chain actors in a certain territory, and then also provide information or market information or um, extension services to the different actors through 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 different mechanisms, and then also the parks facilitate technology transfer and maximize also resource efficiency across the value chains through creating an um, industrial ecology or, or symbiosis. So the parks in general, I think it's also always misunderstood, but just to in one minute to explain what the parks are. The parks are the, the, com the combination of three distinct, but also integrated components. The first one is the hub, the infrastructure, which is, can be from 200 or from 100 to 1,000 hectares of land, and the rural transformation centers, which are uh, closer to the farmers, which provide also services to the farmers and also, let's say, help to aggregate the raw materials. And then the collection sectors, which are, uh, let's say, small markets and rural areas and in uh, areas. So this all area of between 100 to 250 kilometers radius is called agro-industrial parks. So the development of this area takes quite a lot of time to make a conclusion that the park has worked or not. But in a simple terms, what has worked or what has not worked, it is, um, we, we can divide them into five broad areas. And these are important to be kept in mind by the public institutions, by practitioners and technical assistance providers and uh, other stakeholders. This, the first part is the public sector driven approach is is not the best way. So this will have a political influence, especially in the location identification, then everything goes wrong afterwards. The institutional structure should be there. So we, we believe that the weak coordination of stakeholders has been significantly reduced the, the, the success of the industrial parks and agro-industrial parks. Then the, also the ownership of the management of these industrial parks is extremely important, especially if it is run by the public institute or by parastatal, let's say, entities. So the, the industrial park authorities should be autonomous and uh, should focus more on on, on on facilitating instead of putting a lot of regulations. The other one is the, the, the problem of, uh, let's say, lack of uh, integrated I'm, development approach. I'm, I'm sorry, Dijen, can you wrap up your your so The key for success factors are then strong go government ownership and national development strategy, good location, properly analyzed location, focus on commercial viability while at the same time looking at the, the social environmental aspect and building the capacity of the park management are critical for the success of agro-industrial parks. Thank you very much, Allah. Back to you. Thank, thank you, Dijen, for a really, I think you painted such a good picture of, of what all is involved in, in putting together agro-parks and the amount of time that it really takes to see whether these, these projects are successful or not. A key takeaway for me was you said the public sector is perhaps not best suited to put together these agro parks, and yet you mentioned the important role of ministries. So that I suppose means the enabling environment, and I think that's probably a, a point we'll we'll get into uh, later. You know what exactly is the role of government uh, in to support uh, agri food processing. So now it's uh, about time that we turn to the private sector. Uh, we've heard how important the private sector is, of course, in, in driving agri-food processing. Um, really pleased to have with us um, Ashish Pandey, who serves as the country head of Olam in Nigeria. 
Um, Ashish Olam, of course, has a very large presence uh, in the continent um, in agri-food processing, and, and especially in Nigeria, which I think is where uh, Olam got its start. Could you speak to us about your business model, uh, in particular, how you link to farmers, um, hopefully many smallholders, but also the employment generation that you provide through your value-added activities? And then if I can throw in one more question for you, the, the report, the ATOR, does speak about small firms, right, small medium uh, uh, enterprises, as, as really providing the bulk of, of the work in agri-food processing. Of course, you are a very large firm, Olam, but, but maybe you have interact with smaller players. So maybe you could also give us a feeling um, uh, about your sort of how you fit into that uh, landscape of uh, SMEs uh, in Nigeria. Thanks, Ashish. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. So in terms of, uh, you know, just trying to uh, deep dive in terms of Olam's operating model. See, Olam's experience um, has been, uh, been for like three decades in, in Africa, last 30 years. And we've got a rich understanding of the, the continent's agricultural landscape. Uh, we have got to leverage the food sourcing capabilities of processing. And we've been able to develop a, a very strong logistics, uh, you know, value chains, uh, supply chains all across Africa and across the world. We've been able to link uh, Africa to the world and thereby, you know, uh, providing food security to the continent and also generating a lot of employment uh, in the in the in each of the host countries. Uh, presently, uh, if you look at Ulam Agri, as I said, uh, we have manufacturing and trading operations uh, across uh, in Africa, uh, in Chad, in, in Egypt, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, Mozambique, uh, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, South Africa, Kenya, Mozambique. So we are pretty well uh, spread out across Africa. Of course, Nigeria is where we have a, a largest, uh, I would say, uh, manufacturing uh, footprint across the continent. In terms of, uh, we've got close to about 50 plus processing and manufacturing facilities uh, across uh, all the areas. Uh, in terms of our operating model, we, we source uh, uh, a big uh, chunk of, uh, I would say, the raw materials or input materials uh, from Africa, and we do a lot of processing over here. To give an example to you, uh, for of Nigeria, we have a flour milling, one of the biggest flour milling, I would say, or leading flour milling operations in the entire African continent. And we've got 10 manufacturing facilities in the flour milling operations. We've got a very large uh, sesame processing operations uh, where we source sesame from small scale farmers in Nigeria and process it and they ship it to the more uh, developed part of the world, like Europe, US, et cetera. We also have, uh, since we are there in the feed, in, in the flour milling, uh, a bulk of the flour milling uh, output, uh, byproducts like bran, et cetera, can be used for feed milling. And therefore, in 2017, we set up a very large uh, feed milling operation, close to about 700,000 metric tons of uh, feed milling, uh, where we have, uh, we have a poultry feed, we have aqua feed, basically fish feed being made and also uh, day old chicken, uh, you know, uh, chicks facilities at a very competitive prices uh, for entire of Africa. Um, in case of rice, close to about 14,000 hectares of rice farms in the Sarawa state. And uh, out of that about 5,000, 4,500 to 5,000 is fully developed, uh, irrigated uh, paddy fields. And uh, last two, we have two crop cycles, close to 10,000 metric tons of uh, uh, rice being, uh, being cultivated. Now, in terms of working with, with, with farming communities, now, whether be it uh, uh, our rice farms, uh, we, have, we have been able to procure paddy because only a small percentage of rice uh, paddy, which we require for milling is being used or uh, is made by us or, or basically grown by us. A chunk of that comes by working with small farmers. Uh, we work with close to about 5,000 odd farmers uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of rice. Uh, if you look at uh, sesame, we have a similar kind of number uh, where we work with local farmers. Uh, in terms of employment, if you ask me, uh, I would say internally for our operations, we employ close to four and a half thousand people. But uh, apart from that, if you really see in terms of numbers, more, more than uh, I would say a million sort of people directly or indirectly are, uh, are working with us, be in terms of farmers, be in terms of distributors, be in terms of... Uh, you know, transport providers, uh, distributors and set of peoples, uh, suppliers, etc. So we have a large 
because of large operation which we have, we've been able to create a sizable impact uh, in the overall value chain. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Ashish. I, I think it's it's nice that you gave those figures, right, of your four and a half thousand employees, but then the million uh, jobs in a way that you have helped to create uh, indirectly. Um, unfortunately, we we could not have um, somebody from the African Development Bank with us today. Atsuko Tura sends her um, apologies, but we've we've mentioned many times already the importance of um, accessing finance. Uh, so I'm grateful to Usman for stepping in here and giving us a, a sense of how this is being facilitated um, in, in the agri-food processing sector. What are the different initiatives underway? Over to you, Usman. Thank you, Charles. It's, it's uh, uh, rather difficult for me to talk about what uh, the bank is doing and to facilitate this but I can at least say uh, a few words on the importance of what they need to do, and perhaps where the entry points are uh, in bringing finance into solving uh, the problem in the emerging uh, food processing sector, in particular, uh, the processing of, of traditional staples. Um, if you look at that sector across Africa, we're talking about millet or cassava or white maize uh, and the like, uh, those are dominated, and, and fruits and vegetables, by the way, uh, they're dominated by tens of thousands of very small uh, and medium enterprises uh, across the, the continent. Uh, often uh, they are characterized by low anti barriers. Uh, so, a lot jumping into the game, producing the same low quality products, often and selling to the same consumers, which puts a lot of pressure on, on profits. Uh, and um, what is holding the whole sector behind is the lack of capacity to see firms to maturate, to grow, to expand, uh, and to, to um, uh, be big players uh, in, in the system. And that's where really the um, uh, issues of access to investments become important, so that those that are the most uh, uh, important companies, uh, the most innovative, uh, can also expand and then get, you know, pull themselves out of the big, uh, the big group, so to say. So investments in technology uh, innovation, in investment in uh, um, 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 uh, firm expansion, enterprise expansion, and investment in distribution networks and the like. Uh, those are big demand for finance uh, facing the uh, emerging uh, processing sector. What we've seen in not this ATOR, but the ATOR of last year or a year before, we talked about public policies for uh, value chain transformation. We've seen a huge bias, even in government policies, including financing, against uh, these emerging uh, SMEs. Most uh, policies, financial uh, uh, tools and instruments uh, uh, cater for the needs of the big guys or the larger, uh, let's say, enterprises uh, uh, in, in that group. So in these low profit environments and uh, the developing formality uh, in that sector, uh, so you need to be innovative in finding financing uh, instruments that work, and not just in terms of making funding available, but also having innovative uh, mechanisms that make this financing not just accessible, but also uh, tailored to the needs uh, of the uh, emerging, sector, uh, emerging sector. So long-term financing is a huge problem. Um, and uh, private banks are not willing to get into that. Um, it's, uh, we're not in a position to find uh, the incentives uh, and the modalities in the framework to make that possible. Uh, you're dealing with issues of the risking, uh, a sector that is uh, inherently tied uh, to uh, agriculture and the supply of raw materials and the like. So you have a, a context where uh, a traditional financing instruments might not deliver. Uh, so what you need to do uh, to scale up financing and to support the sector is to use innovative ways of doing that. Uh, in the current environment in Africa, I think uh, make use of digital instruments going all the way actually to AI uh, for uh, market intelligence uh, and enterprise intelligence is where I think um, uh, AFDB and others who are trying to solve the financing problem need to go so you can have the reach, the access, the targeting, and uh, the intelligence to allow people to de-risk and also take finance into the system. So let me stop here, Charlotte, just because I jumped into this last minute. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Usman. I appreciate you you're addressing those really important points. Um, we now turn to Tom Reardon. Um, Yo Swinnon referred to a paper that Tom recently co-authored also with Yo, which was a seminal study on value chains. And in fact, Tom is one of the, the top academics on this particular topic. Um, so thanks for being with us, Tom. Um, my question to you today is um, maybe briefly just sort of reiterate what you see as the main drivers of growth uh, in the in the processing sector in, in Africa. And then the, the ATOR does speak about some research gaps when it comes to um, this topic. So what are those gaps and how do you think they can be filled? And then from your perspective, the third question is, what do you see as sort of the top priority actions for governments and development partners to build on and sustain this growth uh, in, in the sector? Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Charlotte. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I think that very often in the discussion about food systems in Africa, one hears the terms, the missing middle, uh, that the supply chain, let's say the small actors in the supply chain are traditional, are stagnant, they're challenged, they're stuck in the mud. And I really want to contrast that view uh, with the tremendous dynamism that we found through our research uh, with IFPRI, in IFPRI and, and with others. And that as uh, Yo was mentioning, with Bart Minton, we've called the quiet revolution in the food systems in Africa. And the image of that, that I have, that I never forget from the wonderful phrase of Usman Badiad a couple of years ago, is he said, the African food system midstream is like a jet. It's already taken off. It is flying at 20,000 feet, but can still fly yet higher at 35,000 feet. So the image from the research that we've done on the ground with a lot of surveys is that there's a, a massive dynamic uh, food system revolution already going on and it's mainly led by small and medium enterprises that have invested massive amounts. And that uh, my phrase has been that there's a hidden middle, not a missing middle. It's hidden from the debate because people say it doesn't exist, we need to invent it. But really, uh, it's very dynamic and it's not missing. And so one of my main messages here is that while it's good to be thinking about new directions and new investments, to realize that the thousands and thousands of small and medium enterprises in processing and in other uh, lateral services that are supporting them, like wholesale logistics, there's massive amount and very dynamic investment that's already been going on for decades uh, that we've been able to identify in the research. And all of that investment by these small enterprises has given rise to a situation where uh, is over 50 years, but really accelerating over the past 20 years, uh, processed food is now a major part of the diets in urban areas, but also in rural areas, among the middle class, but also among the poor. It's mainly first stage process like flour, but it's also become important in second stage processed products like bread. And it's not just in processed foods from retailers, it's also in a very rapid rise of prepared food and food services and small restaurants across the continent. So the images of this build up over time and this giant welling up in a couple decades of demand and of supply. And the drivers of this on the demand side have really been fundamentally saving time. And it's the same reason it occurred in Europe, the US and other places that the opportunity cost of women's time to prepare and process food at home has gone up as women have moved outside the home and worked outside the home and their time has become more pressed. And if you think about it, some old, this is a study in West Africa a couple decades ago, uh, women and girls in villages uh, in West Africa were spending four hours every day per person pounding grain. That's apart from preparing all the food. So there was this tremendous drive to find a way out of that mess. Okay, and so there's a long-term demand that's not going to go away. And on the other side, there's been rapid technology transfer of processing techniques. 
And as I said, this gigantic investment by small and medium enterprises across the continent. And a crucial point, and I'm not contradicting the fact that there could be some use in new investments, uh, in particular special economic zones or whatever, but I really want to point to uh, a, a, a dynamic that's going on that we need to recognize as, uh, as a challenge also to get more research on. But despite there being challenges to the small and medium enterprises, where the enabling conditions are present, especially wholesale markets, roads, electrification, you tend to find a massive spontaneous investment and clustering by small and medium enterprises, for example, in processing. I call it the blood and bones of the food system are the key investments that uh, governments should be making. Roads, wholesale markets, electrification. And where that happens, you find these booms, for example, in Ethiopia, where there was a spontaneous cluster of TEF operations, uh, truckers, wholesalers, uh, TEF millers, uh, and Jeddah uh, preparers. And the cluster grew so quickly over 10 years. To me, it was one of the most dynamic processes I've observed in the world looking across these things. And there was also a reduction of 50% in transport costs. This is worked by Bart Mitz and, and Ethiopian colleagues. 50% in decrease in transport costs and a big decre decrease in milling margins. All of this was driven by spontaneous investments of thousands of small and medium enterprises in processing, wholesaling, and trucking. There were no NGO, there was no large enterprise, there was no directed government in, uh, investment. It was this enabling conditions that are so central, and then it can continue to spark these spontaneous booms across the continent. And the research goal should be to think about how can these government enabling investments leverage the spontaneous dynamism that's already occurring in the small and medium enterprises and push it yet further. And in Usman's words, to get the jet to fly, not just to 20,000 feet, but to 35,000 feet and have a small enterprise revolution in Africa continue and blossom even more. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tom. And uh, we're now moving to the Q&A session of, of this really interesting discussion. So please keep your questions coming in your respective um, uh, chat functions. I'm going to kick off with a couple of questions to Ashish, but I'll ask Geta to come in on the second question as well. Um, so Ashish, uh, somebody's asking how um, the small rice and sesame farmers, which you mentioned uh, Olam procures with, um, who is supporting them with finance and maybe some technical assistance? And then a really, really interesting question from Sadar in Pakistan, who's asking, and, and I wonder if this is, was something that was looked at in the ATOR get on, what percentage of food processing plants are locally manufactured um, and how efficient and economical are they compared to imported ones? Uh, really interesting question. And maybe that I can ask that to you as, as well, Ashish, the plants that you guys have set up, let's say in Nigeria, um, where are you getting um, your material from to build those those plants? So I'll start with you, Ashish, and then turn it also over to Geta on that uh, second question. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, in terms of um, getting our raw materials, etc. When we, uh, if it needs to be from a milling point of view, um, is the question, sorry, is the question about in terms of where are we getting our uh, raw materials for, or is it manufacturing, how is it? Yeah, sorry, there are two questions. One is how how do the farmers with whom you procure, the small smallholders that you mentioned that you work with to procure rice and sesame, how are they supported with finance and technical assistance? Is it Olam that does it or somebody else? And then the second question has to do with the uh, origin of your food processing plants, um, the materials to to build those. Yes. So the first question is like in terms of rice, for example, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria definitely has a has a program in which uh, they extend some kind of loans to these uh, rice farmers, and it's a it's a buyback model. Where in terms of where we say that it's an anchor bar program where we actually. Uh, give a commitment to central bank saying that okay we want to work with with, with this a farmer and uh, we're going to buy back all the paddy 
So that's the way why uh, how we work with the small scale farmers. Directly, we are not into extending any kind of loans, but there are uh, banking institutions and Central Bank has definitely has been working very closely. So that really helps in terms of uh, from uh, up this point of view. Second is also in terms of uh, not putting uh, too much burden on the foreign exchange reserves of the country. We also get uh, soft loans from uh, IFC where uh, we secure these loans and where we've been able to get a lot of uh, working capital requirement funded, uh, funded from these kind of loans. And also doesn't it is, helps, helps to ease up the uh, pressure on the foreign exchange uh, reserves of the country. That's, that's what we do from our side. Uh, in terms of uh, sourcing of uh, uh, raw materials, etc., uh, for building our plants, as we, as I understood the question was, uh, those are from uh, respective areas. For example, if it's uh, wheat milling, etc., it, it'll be flour or it'll be a ruler, uh, etc. If it's it's going to be uh, uh, feed milling, then of course it's going to be vengers, uh, which helps us to get extruders. Um, etc. Uh, for our uh, for manufacturing uh, process and uh, so it depends upon which category. Uh, so we work with all the global players. Uh, as rightly said, our core competitive advantage is our ability to get the right technology in the country and thereby producing uh, good quality products. And our global supply chain advantage helps us to get uh, our raw materials at a very competitive rate thereby producing the right kind of, uh, I would say, finished goods uh, required for a country like uh, emerging countries in, in Africa. That gives us a competitive advantage. Excellent, thanks, Ashish. Getal, do you want to come in on that question of um, you know, the, the, the demand that's created on the processing side for some of the machinery and who's meeting that demand? Is that something that you all looked at? Uh, yes, is it, is it about the share of uh, domestic processing versus, uh, yes? I, I think it's, I think, I think the question uh, uh, our, our uh, friend from Pakistan is asking, the, the manufacturing processes, the food processing plants that have come up in, in Africa, are they local? Are they produced from African technologies, suppliers, or are they imported? Uh, yes, uh, I think basically it depends on the type of value chains, but uh, for some of uh, the global value chains and mostly uh, the, these are, uh, I mean, foreign direct investments and uh, most of them, and they are, but for traditional, these regional value chains, for example, as Tom said, for F, for example, in Ethiopia, and it's purely by domestic, I mean, uh, local investors and uh, they are using some local uh innovations and local inputs and all these things and uh, but for the others and from our studies i mean we don't have specific figures but uh, uh for example for the african vegetables it's mainly uh by by uh because this is a regional value chain and mainly the investment and also the innovations are mainly from uh, uh, african sources so these are the and one important thing that's important is that uh, all the trades. If you look at the intra-African agricultural trade uh, within within Africa, so then the share of these processed products, agri-food process, uh, ranges from forty-five to seventy-five percent. So that means uh, most of them they are processed and consumed uh, within within the continents, uh, and they are also critical uh, in terms of fostering those trades. This may show that uh, most of the innovations might come. Uh, from from uh, uh, the continents. Uh, thank, thanks, Geta. Um, let's maybe move into the into the topic of trade, which you also just alluded to. We we've got a couple of different questions here that I'm going to try to put together. Um, so you just mentioned that process trade actually makes up a huge percentage within intra-African trade, uh, I think 45 to 75 percent, you said, uh, depending on, on the product. Um, but there is a question um, about the, the negotiations underway in the African um, free continental free trade area. Uh, on Sunday, Osiemo from Nairobi is asking, um, um, what about the increasing non-tariff barriers that are being erected against processed foods, especially in, in sanitary and phytosanitary measures? 
how are those being addressed? And then maybe related to that question, we, we understand the importance of process trade and intra-African trade. How does it look for uh, trade outside of uh, Africa? Is, is African processed food going also to other parts of the world? Um, maybe we can first turn to you, Geta, and then if anybody else wants to come in on that, please let me know. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, you're, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, all right that these non-tariff barriers are becoming very critical. Uh, but uh, I mean, um, we did some, some, I mean, based not on, not included in the, in the ETHOR, but from our previous research, research activities and from our previous papers, uh, we realized that the non barriers within Africa is less, 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 less important than with because of the, some street, stringent criteria and all these things. And also the, the African uh, Union Commission with the emergence of the FCFTA. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of initiatives to harmonize these non-tariff measures. And hopefully, I mean, these sanitary and phytosanitary measures, we will not avoid them because they are required for trade to happen and they are required for health issues and all these things given the global shocks related to health. But what we can do is just uh, we uh, facilitate trade. Uh, I mean, uh, help countries to to comply with those standards so that they will not have significant effect on intra agricultural trade. So yes, the, and harmonization is the, the word that mostly used uh, for for I mean uh, removing the impact of this space on intra African agriculture. Great. Thanks, Geta. Well, I, I think your solutions and ideas that are important and a lot of uh, Yeah, that's uh, what I can say about this one. And yeah, can you hear me? Am I dropped? No, I can hear you. Sorry, I think I was having some some issues on my slide. Thank you very much. And and certainly SPS measures are important, as you say. But but I suppose the the point that the questioner is making, if if they're being used in a trade discriminatory way or in a non scientific way, then then that does erect uh, some 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 trade barriers. Um, yeah. Usman, there's a very uh, big question that I would like to uh, uh, put your way. Um, Sarah Lauder from the Food Systems Economics Commission um, in DC is asking, and maybe let's see if you agree with this statement. Um, um, she makes the point that structural transformation has occurred in most regions, except for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, how can we reconcile this with the evidence of transformation that we're showing today in this in this seminar? Do you agree with that statement? And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and if not, why, why not? I, I, I don't agree because the evidence is out. Uh, a few eight hours ago, uh could be 2018 or 17 uh there's a chapter by myself and uh um uh, uh margaret mcmillan uh from ifbury uh that shows that um since the 2000s the patterns of structural change in africa are very much similar to what you've observed uh elsewhere uh, in the world uh and i know that uh maggie has recently also published uh, on that there is now robust evidence that prior to 2000, yes, the statement was correct. Uh, when we had a stunted agricultural sector, anti-agricultural biases and, and what have you, uh, the um, um, uh, start of the CADEP agenda, uh, the entire uh, 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 renewal process under NEPAD, uh, the emphasis on uh, um, scaling up investment in agriculture, uh, on um, uh, evidence-based uh, planning and implementation, the entire uh, um, uh, energy behind agriculture, but also the long-standing um, uh, recovery of African economies, the longest in the history of the post-colonial uh, Africa, 20 years uh, or two decades of sustained progress, that has generated a kind of structural change uh, that Africa was missing uh, uh, until actually just two decades ago. So I think that that is what is reflected in the value chain transforming that we're talking about. There's very much uh, coherence and consistency there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Usman. Um, Dejan and, and Janet, there's there's a very um, 
practical question about agro parks. Um, Iris Kreber from FCDO in the UK is asking, what kind of rules and standards apply for these parks? Are they similar to export processing zones, for example, where normal host country rules and regulations do not apply? Dijen, do you want to take a, a first crack at that? Dijen, if you're trying to come in, we, we don't hear you. Okay. Hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Now, if um, we are developing a park in a country, then the country rules and regulations apply. If we have a cross-border um, parks, like we try to, to work on to develop in Zimbabwe and Zambia, then we have to harmonize the policies and rules and regulations of the two countries for specifically for this agro park development. So this is a very simple answer for the question. Great, uh, thank you, Dijen. Tom, um, would you also like to come in on this question about the structural transformation in in Africa that uh, Usman just uh, just uh, answered? Very much so. Uh, about ten or fifteen years ago, uh, work that IFPRI was doing and I was involved in with, for example, Bart Minton in Asia, showed this quiet revolution, this extremely rapid change in food systems and transformations occurring. And uh, we presented it at a World Bank Rural Week, and people said, well, okay, we think this is happening in Asia, we can see it now, but is there this grassroots transformation occurring in supply chains in Africa? We don't think so. So that was a challenge that was thrown on the table. We went out and did uh, uh, survey work of thousands of small and medium enterprises in a number of countries, and we found that the revolution in the supply chains in Africa was extremely similar in its speed, its entrepreneurial pizzazz, its dynamism that we saw in Asia. We didn't see that Africa was the laggard and wasn't doing it. So that internal dynamism has to be recognized and leveraged and not thought of that when you reinvent the wheel and start something that's not started. Let's support this massive thing that's going. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. Janet, I, I we have a couple of questions that I think get at the gist of, of the following. Um, we, we know that we are facing many, many crises, right? Uh, we, we've got the war in Ukraine now entering its second year. We have terrible climate, extreme weather events all around the world. Now a very devastating earthquake. What's your feeling about the support that you're going to get for CAPS in the midst of all of these crises and needs? And, and how can the case for increased investment and support of agro-processing in, in Africa sort of compete with all these other um, uh, important topics? Oh, I apologize. I think uh, Janet is could not stay with us. Um, would anybody else like to speak to this to this question of um, all of the competing demands um, that the world is facing right now, and how can we keep the focus on the importance of of further support to to agro processing in in Africa? Uh, Tom, I see your hand. Yes, I think that in terms of uh, some of the constraints to the sourcing, for example, of wheat, of edible oil, et cetera, that the, some of the responses that can be made to those constraints has to reside in the kinds of things that Usman saying, investing in uh, the supply of domestically processed grains and domestic grains in edible oils, in increasing the processing capacity of the continent is really can be phrased as a response of resilience and of uh, bouncing back and of avoiding the bullet from uh, some of these global crises. So I think really this these crises add wind in the sails of this initiative. Thank you. 
Yeah, just to yeah. add, just to add on that, you know, uh, for example, Nigeria imports more close to uh, five to five and a half million metric tons of wheat. Uh, if you look at the Nigerian local production, it's less than fifty thousand metric tons. It's nothing. It's in a drop of the ocean in terms of. So what we have done is that we have a uh, we've we've done a foundation called Seeds for the Future Foundation, where we've actually got heat resistance seed varieties, and we're working with ICARDA. We're also working now exploring the work with the CSIRO in Australia, where we are keen to develop the heat resistant variety uh, of seed varieties which you want to import. We set up a model farms in uh, in the lake near Lake Chad uh, area in Maiduguri, where we work with the Lake Chad Institute uh, Research Institute of Nigeria uh, for building the new seed varieties because we know uh, you know Nigeria is a tropical country and wheat it needs is a temperate kind of a crop so we need to have the right adaptive climate adaptive uh, seed varieties to be done i think things like that uh, need to be uh, i think needs to be uh, done by uh, processors and typically we being a large processor we have taken a first step in doing that and we've set us out close to about uh, you know uh, $300,000 in the next 3 to 4 years uh, for the research and development and we will be doing much more of this as we go forward in the next coming years and hopefully uh, trying to develop uh, wheat in, in Nigeria. Thanks very much, um, Ashish and Tom. I mean, in a way you're saying that the, 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 the crisis that we've just seen in terms of, you know, concerns about uh, substantial wheat exports from, from Russia, Ukraine uh, being curtailed actually provides some opportunities here to um, shift more production on, onto the continent. Um, either of wheat or maybe some substitutes, right? And and some of that is already uh, happening. And and thank you, Ashish, for pointing out the work with the Carta, which is of course a a, a sister or CGIR center of of IFPRI. So um, uh, great great work that they're doing in terms of in, enhancing some of the the resilience of crops uh, to to address climate change. So we we have a very important question from Stephanie Mercer from the Farm Journal Foundation, and and this is something that was alluded to as as one of the key needs to make sure that we can keep this agri-food processing revolution going. Um, she's asking what is being done to teach entrepreneurial skills to university students. Um, Usman, is that something I could turn turn over to you? Thank you. Uh... Actually, I would just stop uh, that sentence before talking about university. These entrepreneurial skills uh, need to be taught uh, to the practicing uh, operational folks uh, from you know, um, floor operations to uh, running a company to uh, using these equipments and the like, uh, and the things that you grew up with. Uh, and I think um, trying to uh, limit this to universities is gonna be narrowing quite significantly uh the um, the players and uh, who could benefit from it um i was referring to the large number of smes uh who are processing cassavas as millets and traditional fruits and vegetables and what have you uh, those actors are vital to the growth of the um, indigenous uh, uh, um, uh, processing sector yet having access to skills development is just not in the processing but even on farming, driving a tractor is not like driving a bicycle or, or driving a horse cart. It's something that you need to learn. Changing oil is something that you need to learn. So um, uh, if there's one area where African countries are really way late is the creation of an institution infrastructure for skills development, skills upgrading, uh, for practicing entrepreneurs and producers and farmers, uh, but also to bring that into fundamental research now into the universities and others. So this question might be more important. If this one of these areas where Africa is really, really late and behind, it is in that se in the segment of uh, what needs to be done. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Usman. So it's a really continuous education, right? It's it's not just at the university level, but uh, uh, throughout uh, really one's professional life. I think is the is the point you're you're making. Um, Tom, let me ask you to, to come in on that one as well. Yes, just briefly, um, I agree with Usman, and I think that uh, the skills as well as policies and uh, investments that are going to be in created enabling environment have to be both 
specifically for processing enterprises, but also for the ecosystem that processing is in, because uh, processing enterprises depend crucially on logistics, third-party logistics. And this is often a subject that's not on the radar screen, as well as wholesalers. In our survey that we did of 1,100 maize traders in uh, Nigeria, we found that 4% of them own trucks. 75% of the maize that's being moved in Nigeria is being moved on third-party logistics. During the COVID uh, policies, those third-party logistics were declared non-essential and it, it created a real problem in the flow of uh, the primary ingredients to the mills and to the consumers. So thinking of it as a package, a confluence of players that need to be supported both in skills and in infrastructure is useful. Great, Th thank you very much, Tom. Gita, I'm gonna direct the last question to you, and maybe this is actually the topic of a future ATOR. Um, Boubier Jean-Marie Cadieux from Senegal is asking, what are the opportunities that are offered to the diaspora who are already investing in their country in terms of job creation, production, processing, et cetera? Do, do we have some figures on that? Uh, it's, it's a great question. <laughs> yes, it's a great question, but... Uh... Unfortunately, we don't have specific figures now, but just what we can say is it's a great opportunity. Yes, you are right, because this is one of the areas where uh, investment is booming in uh, some of African cities. I mean, urban and pre-urban cities where there is a growing demand for uh, diverse and convenient food items and all these things. So I think agribusiness, small agribusinesses, and also processing at, at large and medium scales these are hugely I mean, important and also, I mean, somehow there are some studies showing that the profitability of this, this, this opportunity. So probably, I mean, those are very good opportunities for the diaspora and all these things. I mean, but um, uh, we, may, we may do it for the next author, as we said. <laughs> Excellent. So, so uh, thank you to the questioner for, for, that, uh, for that great question. So I'm afraid we're, we, we've come towards the, the end of our program, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank our very distinguished speakers uh, for, their, um, for their presentations and engaging with all of us in, in the Q&A session. We, we heard so many um, recommendations here that, that grow out of the ATOR and that were reiterated by, by all of you. And just to highlight some of them, right? Skills development, hugely important policies for an enabling environment, investment, 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 um, and then trade. We need to uh, have trade facilitation, but also ongoing trade liberalization, um, also really, really important. And I'm gonna take uh, the prerogative of turning to Tom for maybe just giving his closing remarks to this meeting um, and you know, leaving us with uh, what you think is important as we move now also towards the AU summit and what are the things that we really need to um, emphasize here to showcase this very, very important area of, um, of transformation in Africa. I really think that African governments and partners need to focus on the blood and bones of the food system, the fundamentals, the wholesale markets, the roads, the electricity. Uh, what we've seen in so much of our work is that when those uh, elements are in place, the foundation is laid. The demand, this gigantic demand of growing cities, growing incomes, growing needs, growing desires, just creates a giant explosion and boom and dynamism with a grassroots revolution in Africa that's already occurring. And I feel that uh, a key thing is to both support that with the enabling environment and also as researchers to look for those many success stories, find out what allowed them to flourish, figure out what could be leveraged, what constrains them, pull out those constraints and let them bloom. And I think they will be a whole field of continuing flowers blooming next to the new <clears throat> plants of the agri parks and other initiatives so that it'll really be complementary and you'll have a continued uh, intensification of this dynamism of this process that to me 
I always remember this. I'll never forget this because I have a personal view of processed food. My mother felt like she was, uh, you know, caged in the house and wanted desperately to go out and get a job and, and blossom. And uh, when I was, you know, when she was leaving the house to go to the job, she handed me some pop tarts. I know that they're not the most nutritious, but she said, this is mommy's little helper. This is allowing me to get out of the kitchen and go fulfill my dreams. Otherwise I would be here, you know, tied to this. And so I think of processed food as a women's liberation movement. It's also a stabilization and a food security movement. And I really applaud uh, what Academia has done and if we have done in bringing these things to the table. Thank you very much. Excellent, Tom. You, you, you raised something that hasn't come up here, which is concern about the rise of uh, processed foods in people's diets. Um, I know there are some concerns about that, uh, specifically ultra processed foods, but you make an excellent point that uh, this has certainly uh, made for more convenience and uh, it reduced the time burden of, of, of women's work, hugely important topic. So we now have the topic of a future A tour and maybe the topic of a future <laughs> seminar on, uh, on the nature of processed foods, the pros and cons. Uh, so uh, thanks so much to all of you, um, especially our partner Academia 2063 for putting on this event with us. And please tune in for a next IFPRI policy seminar, which will take place on March 2nd at nine o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, where we were looking at the PROWEA um, complementary indicators for nutrition sensitive agriculture and market inclusion projects. Have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.